Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Anna Maria Precop. Anna, it's an absolute pleasure. How are you, my friend? I'm so wonderful, Viraj. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here with you today. I'm very much looking forward to this. I spent a lot of time researching and trying to put this put this question schedule together for you. So, like, let's dive straight in. Um, growing up, did you have any any entrepreneurial traits? Somehow, because so when I was young, very young, since maybe kindergarten to around high school, I was always very shy, obedient kid. Never caused troubles to my parents. I was always on um, um, the one of the best students in my school, like since kindergarten till almost the end of my master degree and so on. But however, I was always a small leader, meaning that I was teaching the kids in my neighborhood mathematics and literature. Uh, then I started to teach mathematics in orphanages. Then I led a few teams in my schools, like Erasmus projects or mm -hmm. other fundraising campaigns and so on. Started my own school for summer school for children at some point. I was being on stage, being in competitions. So even though I was very shy inside and anxious, I was always, you know, there. I was always have you, ever, have you ever reflected on that and thought about like why? I don't know exactly why, but I think that this happened because I was a very loved child. Mm -hmm. My grandparents wanted a girl a lot because they had only boys. So the moment I came into this world, they took care of me and they they were so proud of me and they presented me to everyone like I was a goddess which just who just came to the world. So they basically I was able to multiply and read and write when I was four because they put a lot of effort into me. Not because I was a genius or anything like that, but they put a lot of effort and they always presented me like I was such an amazing person and child and smart and bright and beautiful. So I think that played a really important role in my early That's childhood. That's awesome. Anna, what was family life like in Romania? Romania is a country who, which is very family oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, we had barbecues almost every week. Uh, 20 people in our house all the time. I used to play uh, football. We, we had basically a football team in my family. We were always 15 on the stadium, which was 10 meters away from my home, always playing there on Sundays. Board games with my family. I also have a younger sister. We were always a connected family. Uh, yes, that's that's something I got a lot as a kid, a lot of love. Many things didn't work out, right? Like some pressure put which was put on me on my shoulders or a little bit of patriarchy here and there and so on but the love was always there and that that this is what i appreciate the most about my family how would you how would you describe your your little sister my little sister wow it was a long journey to accept her um <laughs> because she's the opposite of who i am uh she was never really good in school um, and I always felt like my parents didn't put, they weren't as tough with her as they were with me. They never checked their homeworks as much as they checked my homeworks, for example. And uh, I felt like I have to take the lead and actually show my parents how to be a parent for my sister. So it was really, really hard to accept her uh, until she turned 14. When I said, look, I, told, I think I read in a book and I told myself, if I want her to become a beautiful human being and be happy, I need to let her do her thing and just give her the context to grow, but I cannot force the growth. And this is what I've been doing in the last few years. And we became closer than ever. And um, she's going to start studying at the same university I started at. Uh, she wants to also be an entrepreneur. Things started to align in a beautiful way especially after we also had partners so it's 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 like things started to to unfold beautifully but it took I'm, a lot of time for me to accept i love that i love that you finally you you reflected and had the moment to to really accept her as, as her own human being instead of trying yeah. to control her life in, in the way that you might have yes. when you started look i want to yes. jump forward to to your masters right why did you feel like you had to do one Wow. So the thing with the master degree is that 
when I applied, so I was studying in Romania. I mm. went with Erasmus twice. So basically I studied for half a year in two different countries, in Spain and France. And I, I always felt like I have a lot of potential. And I also felt like I'm not challenged enough in my country. I, I, I had a business and I was leading a few NGOs outside my university and I was still in top 1%, right? So I never felt like things were so difficult. Although my teachers were incredible. I was having coffees with them all the time, talking, asking for advice for my business. And so it was an incredible time. Also, I love my hometown. But I felt like I'm not achieving my full potential. And I also wanted, it was a bit ego driven to start a master degree somewhere else. I just felt like I need to prove myself and to my hometown that I can study somewhere else coming from my background. Like coming from a pretty modest family, went to a normal high school, went to a normal university and so on. And I wanted to prove that I can get to a top university in Europe, basically. It was like, I wanted to prove a point. I want to prove myself that I can do it. And I applied to only one master degree, only one specialization. It was my like real life, my moonshot. And yeah, I worked for one year to apply for the master's degree, getting all the certifications I needed and so on. Many people helped me with the application. Incredible people from around the world helped me. And I got it. I got in. How did you feel? It was incredible. Yes. The moment I, I read the email, I cried. I was so happy. I said, I'm going to show everyone that. This little girl who they underestimated and who always tried to create projects and they told her that she's wasting her time and she should make money instead of creating impact in the society and so on, she did it. And for me, it felt like, you know, a moment where I, I was so proud of myself. It, it was also a bit um, de uh, depressing because my parents weren't happy when they saw the email. They never wanted me to leave Romania. Uh, because we're a very close family, so it's really hard when one person leaves. It was really hard when I left, everyone crying. It was really, really difficult, emotionally speaking. I all I cried every, every day for like two months straight. It was difficult because I love my family. But I was so proud of myself that... Um, and I also felt very challenged in that master degree. I felt like, yeah, this is where I want to be. Oh. I love that for you. Look, I want to, I, I found it so interesting that you went and achieved this dream of yours. And then you went on a gap year, like halfway through it, right? How did you convince the dean to let you go and build startups? Not, not that is many stories. The thing is, after the first semester, Zvezden, my partner, um, we were living together in Paris. Uh, and he had a pretty bad co-foundership relationship before so in december two years and a half ago uh he broke up with the other co-founder and he said and i want to build a company and i said cool go build a company i said no but i want to build it with someone i really trust and i said well let's build a company together i can close my previous company and we can build something together if you want because we have really complementary skills and he said i'm not building anything with you if you don't drop out because he was never into school he already kind of dropped out, like he just passed all the courses and so on. But I was really into my university. I was like, oh, I wanted to be top 1%, right? Like, uh, he was right. I could do not you, grow a, build co a big company. Do you feel like it was an ultimatum in that sense? Like, I, obviously, it's a hard conversation to have. But was it like, <laughs> yes, was it, was it, are you going to go and do this thing over here? Or do you want to go and build something incredible with me? And not to say that's yeah, a bad thing, yeah, but was did like it that, feel yeah. like that? It was, it was definitely like that. Is that what you needed in that moment, do you think? So he always challenged me a lot to push my limits. I'm usually a very ambitious and confident person, but when it comes to pushing my limits, I always breathe a little bit before that, you know, especially if it's a big decision. And I love academia. Being a teacher was always my plan B if entrepreneurship, let's say, doesn't work, right? So uh, I loved Paris. I loved the school. I loved what I was studying. Everything was perfect. I was getting scholarships, so my parents didn't have to pay me anything, even though they couldn't anyways. Right. So everything was perfect. But when he said that, something activated inside myself, especially because I also had a coach at that time. So we unlocked some more things before I had to make that decision. But the reason why I made the decision was not because... 
I wanted to build a company. That was the second reason. Mm -hmm. But the first one was because I was so scared to do that. I was so scared because it was, to me, even though I, I, I did many things before my master's degree, but to mm -hmm. me, that decision was the biggest I made until that point. And I, I made it because I was so scared to do it. And I said, I need to see how it feels to do something that's so scary. So I knowing, what, knowing what you know now, then, would you go back and do it again? Yes, 100%. Every because time? Every time. It was, it was really difficult. I mean, we moved to London. We had no money. We were really broke. Our parents couldn't help us financially at all. We didn't have an idea. We just knew that we want to build something. It was really, really difficult. Uh, we lived in a matchbox for like six months or something. It was really bad. But by the time we raised our seed round, like in the exact same month, this is when my coll colleagues graduated. So the exact same month, they announced their graduation and I announced our seed round. Exact same month. That's awesome. I imagine that. Yeah. So you'd, you would have you would have just completed the masters, but instead you've gone and actually built the company or started to build the company, get on the right tracks of building it. Look, I want to, I, I know, I know the story of how that did came about. It's quite like, it's quite available in, in some of the other shows that you've done. But what I'd love to ask is, can you set some context on how you figured out what you were building was like a viable idea to go and then raise that, that seed round? Yeah, well, it was a long journey. Now that I look back, I have the impression that we never figured out how to build a company and what a viable idea actually means and how to test that, what that actually means and so on. But at that time, what we thought that means is to basically talk with a few companies. We talked with 20, 30 crypto companies because we started mm. in, in the Web3 space uh, where privacy and decentralization are basically one of, some of the main pillars of the Web3 space. And we just talked with many companies. They said, yes, we love this. We want identity verification, which is done in a way that can protect the identity of my customers, but also in a way that's not super expensive for me to do that as it's just an experiment for me. Um, regulations were coming in the crypto space. So everyone was super afraid of this. They didn't know how to comply with those because KYC processes can look very intrusive. Mm -hmm. And it, it just doesn't align with the values of the Web3 space and so on. So we said, wow, that looks interesting. Let's build something in this area. Um, what does that look like? Like, obviously, you're having conversations. What are the hardest things I do? Like, ideas are super cheap but then the execution is actually like building the damn thing is where it's at right that's that's where your core value comes from it i'm the one that can build this differently to everyone else and make it successful when you're talking to these companies what are you asking them to try and figure out where those kind of pain points lie so you can go this is the slither of gold that you've given me that allows me to go and build this thing if you ask me now, I, I, I'm having a very different response <laughs> than I would have had two years ago. Two years ago, we just went to them and said, look, do you need identity verification? Like we, we thought of this. We think privacy is very important to add it as a layer on the identity verification field and so on and so on. Do you like we were, we didn't do the mom test. It was like, do you need it? And we kind of were pushy and said, so there wasn't, okay. there wasn't a why now. Because like you must have, you must was. have had that question posed to you from investors, right? So there was a why now because what we built two years ago, what we started to build two years ago, would have not been possible a few mm. more, more years ago because technology was not as advanced. So it was, it was the why now was quite strong, right? And even though the technology was there, it was not, it, it was still not enough. So Zvezin had a really difficult time as the tech leader in this company to figure out innovative ways on how to make this possible because all words are against us. That's why right now we have a patented technology because it was really difficult and it was, an, it was basically an innovation to create what we created. So the why now was quite strong, I'd say. When, you're, when you were raising, right, and obviously you've, you've figured out what the idea is, you've figured out it's a viable idea, it's the idea you want to commit to. When you're raising rounds with investors or you're starting to do some sort of raise, do you build a POC or do you just like build a presentation that's like, this is my vision of the future. Can you invest? We had what, both. what do you think? You had both. Love we it. had both. Yeah. Yeah. So because we got the grant one year before we got the seed round. Mm -hmm. So we had the space 
and the money to create a proof of concept. That was very important because it's hard to imagine how this can work if you never saw such a process before. What did you find difficult in making that POC? Because I work service side and for me, it's always you end up pitching visions and I hate it with a passion. It's like anyone can do that. It's just storytelling. But like when I show it to you and it's really crass, but it doesn't really work, but this is how I might build it. Yeah. That for me is beautiful. Was it, was it a similar experience for you? Yes, it felt so great. Like the moment the first passport worked with our app, it felt like we need to celebrate <laughs> because it took, it took around eight months to develop the first proof of concept. Because I told you, it, it was a complete innovation. This mm-hmm. thing, I think we are one of the first companies in the world to develop this because it doesn't look, it's, it's hard to imagine how can, how this can work behind the scenes. Because usually zero knowledge proofs are not really used on device because they are very computationally heavy and all this. It, it's it's more complex, right? Mm-hmm. Well, right now more companies do that for sure. But two years ago, it was not that sexy. I mean, everybody was talking about zero knowledge proofs and so on, but it was not as sexy as it is right now. So it was, we talked with some of the top researchers in the world you working on this field specifically to be able to eventually develop what we have today that's awesome it was difficult to to create the first proof of concept i love that i love that you did it though i love that you got it off the ground look i i'd love to ask you when you first started raising i heard Mm -hmm. that you found it quite difficult why did you find that was was it was people not understanding what you were building and what did you learn from that process yes so it was we we were not as confident as we are today. I felt like we were so excited about the product when you have to sell people a dream. Mm. This is all about. The product was cool. The technology was cool. These investors don't have deep knowledge about how this works. So they don't get as excited as we did, right? We needed to sell a dream and we were not good at that at all. We were, Zvezda is a bit too selling, a bit too pushy. I was a bit too shy. So it was a bit complicated, but mostly because of that. Not because the, we have the same vision today. We have, the product is just more, more advanced today, but it's very similar to how it was one year ago, for example, when we raised and so on. So nothing really changed. The only, the only thing that changed was us our approach and how we talk with them how we made sure that we schedule the next call and if it doesn't happen we message them the, the investor saying hey look if, are you still interested because we don't want to waste each other's time like we became more we embodied ourselves and we said look if you want to invest good if not that's fine we're going to make it work by ourselves you know but at the beginning we looked very needy we also didn't have the big backgrounds like coming from Stanford and Harvard and so on Mm. and that was difficult we know some investors who passed on us because we didn't have all the stamps of approval they were looking for can I ask like just on a personal note that does that add fuel to the fire I'm going to make this thing work or is it like oh charge it to the game yes yes it definitely fuel fuel the the desire to to make it work because it really hurt, you know? It sucked, but it you also... You to the choir. I, I completely agree. I'd love to ask you, I heard that you raised $2.5 million in three days from your experience in Denver. Can you walk me through the story of like play by play how you guys ended up doing that? I've talked to a couple of founders. I've talked to people on like service side as well. And they're like, how? I've never, I've, I haven't heard anyone do that in a long time. Uh, walk me through, like, how did you think about the, the ideas that you came up with to go and go and get that done? So the context before that matters. So very in short, we started, so we raised money, we raised, uh, we kind of got all the term sheets last year in March, hmm. but we started to raise money last July. So not one year ago, but two years ago. So since July to January, we got nothing. We got no's, we got costed, everything but money. So we only had one or two angel investors and that was it. And then what happened last year in January, February, we got some really interesting angel investors in the round. We eventually opened more doors to even more incredible angel investors. So when we went to Denver in March, end of 
February, beginning of March, we already had a few angel investors who were absolutely incredible, like unicorn founders, someone who was already in the identity space and he sold his company for seven billion dollars and so on. Like some really we had two, three, four big names, which helped a lot when we went to Denver. And when we went to Denver, because we couldn't attract we couldn't attract VC funds. That was our problem. When we went to Denver, we said, look, we took a loan to come here. This is our last conference before we give up on the project because we just didn't have funds at all. We didn't pay. We haven't paid our like our engineer for a few months. We didn't pay ourselves for a few months. It was we took a loan to get to Denver and we said, this is our last chance. So what we did, we at the conference, we didn't have money to sponsor it so if you want to be in the you know for the investors to see you it's better to be a sponsor even if you're a small one but we didn't have Mm -hmm. money for that so we just borrowed um, a whiteboard from somewhere a table and two chairs and we pretended to be sponsors so this is how we got one of the term sheets (laughs) because they just came they talked with us um, they liked us. We scheduled two more calls in the next two days because all partners were in town. So the everything moved very quickly. Then uh, the second term sheet, we got it at an event, same night. Basically, we said, hey, we already have this VC fund who's in. They were just interested, but we said, they're in. Uh, also, this angel investor and so on. It's really, if you want to invest, it's now or we have the round full. Because we wanted to, to raise 1 million, not 2.5. So the round was already full, basically, with the other VC, right? And we said, guys, you're either in or I'm sorry, but you're missing it, right? And within 48 hours, we also had them and they wanted to lead the second VC. And then we went to a demo day within the exact same three days. And we said, look, 10 people will present their companies there. It's going to be so boring that nobody cares like everyone will talk about their companies like it's their baby nobody cares about us so i said Zvezi, if we want to attract attention we need to do something different we need to be different so we realized that the hardest thing to present in our company is the problem and solution especially the solution part so we made a theater play to for half of our presentation Basically, I was on, uh, it's more complicated actually to explain that. But yes, we made, so half of our presentation was a theater play. Was it awkward? Human me, human me. So half of, basically it was embarrassing. Yes. Was it awkward? Yes, for sure. But at the end of the presentation, I'm not going to explain because it's more specific to the Web3 space. So it's, um, it's, yeah, maybe not everyone will get the <laughs> how awkward it was. But basically, at the end of the presentation, the person, uh, the person from the our lead investor, current lead investor, came and said, "Guys, that was interesting. I loved you guys. I, we want to do to make something work." And I think within 24 hours, we also got a term sheet from them for one million. And then we met with the founder of the, the that VC fund, and he said that let's put 1.5. And basically, this is how we got from 1 million to 2.5. I love uh, it. That is awesome. Yeah. What What did you What would you What would you advise first time founders from an experience like that? Like, is it Is it just go and do something crazy in the context oh. of a of a raise to to actually put eyes on you? Or is it something more nuanced than that? So I think there are three key things, really. Like if I'd start a company again today, I'd do three different things. So the first one is I'd start with to run small, cheap, and quick experiments to test if what I want to build is really what people need. Mm-hmm. Like without money, just getting a loan from a friend uh, for me to get first one, two months and really run super many small experiments every three days every two days just and that can work for anything beside b2g it can work for b2b it can work for b2c it's easy especially right now with all the tools and it's so easy to reach people on linkedin and so on so it's easy right you can do that so when you go to investors you have you show them that you understand what's happening behind Mm -hmm. the scenes it's not just a dream People actually need it. And you don't need thousands of signups, right? But at least show that you understand what's happening behind the scenes. And it's not just an idea. Second, I'd improve myself a lot. I'd be more confident. I'd be more charismatic. 
I'd smile more, right? I'd know my numbers better. And I will not put as much pressure. Like If they want to be in, that's fine. If they don't want to be in, fine. I'm going to get a part-time job and I'm going to make it work. Like Don't be needy. Don't put, don't put your power on someone else's shoulders. That's very important. So small, quick, cheap experiments. Work on yourself and how you present yourself in front of investors. Record yourself and watch yourself. Are you proud of what you're seeing there? If not, then work on that. Um, I forgot what was the third thing about investors. But yeah, it was a lot about who, not how. So try to get to the right people. Try to get warm introductions to those funds, not to get there by yourself, because they get thousands of people wanting money. You need the faster um, track. So, And the only way to get that is either by creating something crazy, like you stand out, which I always encourage. Try to stand out all the time. Try to go the extra mile. Try to give them more than they ask for and all these things, but also try to get warm introductions to them. How would you... I like, I think getting warm introductions are the single hardest thing, especially when you're in those early stages, because no one trusts you and warm introductions are based on trust. What is, if like, if you had to narrow it down to one thing, the core reason of how you get someone to, to build trust with you to proceed in a warm introduction, like give you a warm intro, what would it be? How you are as a person, the energy you bring to the room at a hundred percent. Like I trust people and 30 seconds if I resonate with their energy. They might, it might not be right, but in most cases, I was right when it came to feeling the energy of people. You just feel it. When, some, when someone walks into a room, it, you just feel if they drain the energy or they, they grow it, right? So the confidence you have in yourself when you talk, the words you choose to use, English is not my first language and I still make many mistakes. I still have an English teacher and so on, right? I'm still trying to improve that. But when I talk, I'm confident about what I'm saying. When I talk about audit, I know what the vision is, right? And if someone comes and says, oh, but that vision is stupid. That's perfect. That's great. Okay, tell me more about what you think. I'm not going to change my vision because someone told me that it's bad, right? So it's how you are as a person. That's why I think you should work on yourself uh, and read self-development books and uh, watch, I don't know, leaders, spiritual leaders, whatever, as much as you're working on your company. It's very interesting. I, that's, a, that's some controversial advice right there. I think I get it to an extent. Like everyone, everyone should work on themselves. You should have some models for getting through life. I've got mine. I'm sure you've got yours. Sometimes I think it gets a bit much, like, especially when you start absorbing personalities, like you can have the, the sales guy, you can have the vision maker, you can have the, the technical guy in you or gal in you. But when you, when they're not you and you don't add your own flair to them, I find like, that's where, that's where there's a disconnect. When does it disconnect? Sorry? When, so when, when, there's, when, there's a, when there's a disconnect between you as a human being and like who you truly are, especially in those meetings, and the individual that you're trying to be. So for instance, I, right. I, I, I sell a lot. Like every day I'm getting no's, right? About, and it's, I chose the game that I'm in. But if I'm going to be this super hard salesy guy, I know that's not me. Like it's never going to work. It's not who I am. And if I try that, it's such a big disconnect from who I am that it's going to look so forced. So I resonate, I get it, but right. uh, I think to a point it gets like there's a little too much. But look, I'd love to know, what do you know about that? Just the entire experience of building startups that you consider to be true that others, others don't. Yeah, exactly what I said, <laughs> that you should work at yourself as much as working on your startup. About what you said before, I think this is why people get anxious, depressed, and burned out because they have two different personalities or even more, and they are not aligned with themselves. The way I work in business is the way I'm at home with Vezi. Like, Vezi, you didn't take that trash out for two days. We said that you have to do that yesterday, correct? It's like, create, like, it's the exact same thing. Well, I still struggle sometimes with anger and, you know, anxiety and all these things. But I'm trying to be like Anna, who is in business, kind and caring and bold and courageous. I'm the same at home. Mm. I'm the same with my friends. Like I don't, for example, I don't accept BS. Like if you start complaining to me about things I don't care about and you start complaining for three hours in a row, 
and I, I say, okay, let's find a solution. Like, yeah, but I just want, I don't want a solution. I just want to be, to complain. That's not me. I will not work with you. I will not be a friend with you. I will not be a partner with you. It's the exact same thing. Like setting boundaries. I will not be very sweet with Vezdi, for example, in the way I talk and then use only bad words and be super tough in business, right? Or be super tough in business and then be super attached and cry all the time at home, right? Then you have division mm -hmm. and that, that creates turbulence, that creates depression, that creates burnout, right? I think that's why most of the people between 20 and 30 struggle a lot. Because there's someone at home, there's someone at work, there's someone with their friends, and it's hard to keep up with those. It's like living three lives in one, right? So this is what I think. I think it's a bit controversial right now, but I think slowly but surely people move more towards well-being and being aligned and centered with themselves and just putting more effort into who they are in general. I feel like you. I feel like there's a well-being startup in you, at least in this lifetime, for sure. I don't think so. <laughs> you don't think so? No, I, I'm. I've got a feeling. Just here, like I, I've got a feeling. Maybe, maybe. But look, I, before we get on to the future, I want to talk about the present. What yes. makes what makes a good co-founder for me? For you? Yeah. So trust, a hundred percent. I need to trust the other person as much as possible. I need to trust that um, if we decide on a specific goal, we really try to make it work. Or if some things are happening in the middle, we communicate that. Or I have to trust that when we go to networking events, for example, that person cheers me up and they, they look for opportunities for me as I do for them. Or the trust that you want the best in the other person that you want them to grow and you give them the context to grow not necessarily push the growth that's important and this is what i learned from dealing with my younger sister besides trust communication is also very important i i i was surprised to see how many people do not communicate clearly how many people don't communicate honestly because they think that the other person will be affected while mm -hmm. this actually creates more damage in the future and so on and beside that kindness, I really look forward in all my current and pot potential co-founders to be kind, like to be a good human being and to look for win-win situations all the time without fail and to always look for the good in people and to treat each other with kindness in general. I love that. I had the pleasure of talking to your partner and uh, having, an, uh, having a conversation with him. How did you meet him? It's such a great story. <laughs> yeah so we met we met in tenerife while hiking a mountain we were hiking the same mountain it was it was a crazy thing because i didn't want to go there it was five euro five euro for me was quite a lot of money at the time i was already waking up at 5 a.m every morning in tenerife because i was studying there with erasmus i also had my company back then i was leading a few ngos it was i was waking up at 5 a.m in the morning just to make sure i can get everything done so it was really difficult. Like for me to disconnect for half of the day on a hike, it was impossible. And to, on top of that, to pay five euro, it was like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> but my, my uh, friends convinced me to go there eventually. And this is when I met my partner. And it looks like the, those five euros were, were the best investment <laughs> I've made so I, far. I love it. Look, I, I want to ask, you know, the, the co-founder the co -founder relationship that people have, especially when they're not romantically involved, is, is difficult at its best. What's it like working with someone that you have a relationship outside of work with to build a company, to build product? You mean, and we are also a couple together? Yes, when you're also yeah, a couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, I think the role of the woman in that relationship is very very important because if as a woman you are more shy and you don't really want to go to networking events if you don't really want to participate in raising money or if you're more yeah more shy and more uh, you don't set boundaries properly or you are not a, at least a bit tough with what you want and what makes you happy and what makes you achieve your goals and so on i think the relationship is not going to work because usually men are more dominant in business. And um, if you get to a meeting where 
the guy is talking all the time and he's loud and he's smart and you say nothing or you just intervene, but it's not necessarily the best intervention ever, the people will always think that he's running the whole company and you're just there because you are um, his partner. But do you not feel like, and, and humor me for a moment, do you not yes. feel like sometimes spine, uh, silence speaks volumes? There are a lot of meetings that I, that I have where like if other people are leading and they are more technically savvy in those conversations, like I don't need to say anything. I'm not going to add any value to it. I'm just going to waste my breath and not, not waste my breath on the other people. <laughs> but because like it's a way, I'm not adding any value to the conversation. It would just be regurgitating the context that we've already set. Do you, do you feel the same way or do you feel like you have to sometimes have an input to show that you exist as well? No, 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 no. So it's not about that. Like in technical meetings, I'm usually silent. Maybe I ask one, two questions at the end. Like, okay, guys, you heard that. When do we schedule the next meeting? <laughs> right? Like I usually take that side uh, and it, it's fine. But we're not only talking about technical meetings. Before you get to a technical meeting, you first have an introductory like a discovery call, right? And then you have another meeting and maybe then you get to the tech, technical meeting. So in those meetings, if, if, for example, if we're talking commercial, the commercial side, marketing, branding, or business, whatever, and Zvezi doesn't have a good input, he's not going to participate, but he's going to be fully immersed into it. And you can see it on his face that he's there, right? Not looking on his phone or like just smiling, you know, that dumb smile or like, no, it's like we are fully here and we're the founders of this company. You know, no, I get it. I think one of the one of the toughest things that I've found uh, more recently is it's the it's the I'm here but I'm not here thing. Like you can see when someone isn't concentrating, it, it kills me. Hundred percent, a hundred percent. And and I I I in every ounce of my being, I want to call it out because when I sit here, I've got two things on one, I've got things on the other side, but I'm immersed in this conversation. Like I'm doing, I'm giving you my fifteen minutes, right? This could have been an email, but I'm right here. And it, it's so, oh, but yeah, a conversation for another time. But I think this is where kindness comes into place. Like I have days when it, in which Viraj, I find it so difficult to focus. I know I heard some bad news. I had a fight with Vesden. My, nothing worked in that day, right? I just find it so hard to focus. Mm. And I appreciate when people say, hey, look, we, if, if you want, but they don't make it obvious. Like it's, it's obvious that I'm not fully there, but they don't make it obvious. And they say more like, hey, would you like to have, like, we can keep it short now and we can reschedule the call. Mm -hmm. uh, or like sometimes they take it on themselves and it makes me breathe a little. Or they just, uh, they, or just we entertain each other in different ways or we have a lighter conversation. Like it's, you know, you never know what's behind the scenes. So that's why, like, I am tough. I'm like, okay, if the person is not here, I will be very gentle and say, let's try to reschedule. We can keep it lighter today or I have to run, you know, something to make it easier for them. What's but, really uh, interesting is I don't, I don't, I, I like, given, I can see it. I given, can see given, it. <laughs> so if you're late, if you're late by five minutes, I'm not there. Like I've, I've already killed the meeting, canceled it and sent you an email saying, let's reschedule another time. Like that's just me, but I will, I will be ready if you go, actually, I'm ready 10 minutes later and I'll be there. But for me, it's like, why? Why am I going to sit there with the call? And, you know, everyone has their own reasons for doing things. Everyone has their own context that you don't understand. And you have to empathize with that. But let's be honest, like those five minutes could mean the difference between three emails being sent and actually clicking lines of code or yeah. something like helping build a presentation. It's just my opinion. Well, but I, I feel fully like agree. I fully agree, but I think the most important thing is communication. Like if they send an email or a very short message, doesn't even have to be grammatically correct, right? Like, hey, sorry, I'm five minutes late, just lost the tram. That's it. Like yeah. I'm so fine waiting for five minutes, but it's so uncommon to do that. Like most people who are late in my meetings, they don't send that message ever. I know, I know. It's it's when they get on. You know, you know what I would really like? Like just give me the emoji. Because you know you put the icons on Outlook. Just send me an emoji, literally two clicks. That's all I like. That's all I want. Just give me the communication. So I completely resonate with that. I, yes. What I'd love to understand is, you know, we mentioned this earlier about complementary skill sets. Yeah. What do you think is great about Zvezde? Is please correct me if I'm saying it wrong. Yes. What is great about him that allows you to be awesome as well? Whoa, there are so many great things about him. 
especially because I know him uh, more than anyone else, right? He's a very so deep down, he's a very genuine and pure person. Like I incredibly rarely I saw him act based on ego. Very rarely. Very rarely. And that for me was something that made me fall in love with him at the beginning. That's one thing. Then he's very he challenges the status quo all the time. Sometimes I even feel embarrassed. Or it's just he just pushes my limits way too much. And I feel like I just want to slap him or something like stop pushing my limits. I don't want to it sounds weird, but I don't want to grow right now. I don't want to I don't want to get this I don't want to drop out right now. Why why did you come and tell me this right now when you could have done it in one year and a half and I finished my master's degree, right? Like he tends to push and he really pushes. I mean, he's not the type of guy who says it once and then he forgets it. It's like, no, it's like, you know, it's there all the time. And but you, know you it's want there. that. You, like, you really want that sometimes. Well, I appreciate it, but it's hard to live with such a person because you feel challenged all the time and it's difficult, right? Or he challenges my you, all the time. How do you square it off? Like, it's, it's obviously, it's a difficult, it's, it can be difficult to live with. It can be, it can be difficult to work with as well. Um, how do you square it off in both in both parts of your life? You mean how how do, how do we balance them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we it, we used to be very bad at it, <laughs> but now it's getting better and better. And I think the reason why I mean the reasons why is that first we work a lot on improving ourselves. We, really work a lot on that, like to become a better human being, to talk to communicate more clearly, to have more empathy for each other. We talk a lot. So like, okay, so when I say that, what do you feel, right? Like after a fight, he comes to me and says, hey, look, uh, that made me feel like that, right? I'm like, oof, sorry for that. I really had another intention, right? Well, it's not as perfect as it is, it looks like, but we really work a lot on making sure that the other person doesn't feel small or stupid or not enough right and we don't push growth that's something we're still learning to not push growth but to create the context um and we also have our time for ourselves i mean we go on dates right well it's more like business right we put it in the calendar we go on a date on wednesday or it's like we have our we celebrate our anniversary every month and so on so we we have all these moments where rarely but we have these moments when we don't talk about the company right like going to the theater or trying something together, doing something how, else together. How do you think he would describe what it's like to work with you? <laughs> it depends on the face. But um, I'd say he would say that I'm also very pushy and tough. Like if he says, I, I, okay, I'm going to do this by tonight and he doesn't, I, I'm like, okay, you didn't, but you don't go to sleep until you don't finish it. Mm-hmm. Or okay, we just we just got home from a flight. It's like four a.m. in the morning, but really have to send the document. Like we must send the document, right? Or all, I'm I'm very pushy when it comes, especially to external commitments. Like we we have to get it done, even though you feel like doing it or not. So I think he would say that I'm a bit tough when it comes to these things. Uh, he would also say that I'm quite shy, for sure, and that um, I'm not extroverted enough for what my job requires me to do in a way he would also say that i'm kind i think i'm also trying to you know to 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 be good with people i think he would say that yeah did you have a did you have a conversation with him before this before this (laughs) no no i I (laughs) don't know what you talked with him about to a t to a t it's it's almost like you know each other no for real i can't believe that it's a so, lovely question to throw in. It's 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 oh, incredible wow. how much you obviously communicate, I'm and I proud think that of that's him. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did it right. <laughs> Look, I, I want to switch gears slightly. I hear you just got back from uh, from an island with uh, Richard Branson with a lot of other founders and incredible people. How has that experience changed the way you look at the world and what you're building at the moment? That's a really good question. We asked the hard ones. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, usually I think that one single experience doesn't change everything, right? It's an accumulation of more factors. But the time on the island made me realize that, one, people who are way further down the line than me 
Mm. Personally speaking, financially speaking, professionally speaking, spiritually speaking, are not that different than where Zvezi and I are right now and the mm. questions we ask ourselves right now. And that was so beautiful to see because sometimes I feel like I'm not enough to, you know, oh, be the CEO of a company or like to to uh, start one more thing in the meantime because I truly believe in something or you know, or to, I don't know, to employ more people. And also, I, I sometimes feel like I'm not prepared for this, but it looks like you you never get prepared. So you just have to make the step. That's one thing. And the second thing, I realized how good this connection is. Uh, I usually take my moments. Like I usually, I enjoy solitude. I take my moments. Uh, I spend time every week, you know, reading and um meditating and doing other things which are for my personal growth but disconnecting in that way i usually i would not take one full day off right or two days in a row but the time i spend there in nature with incredible people made me realize how important the people around me are because i usually i i never really had friends like many friends or many people around me i was really satisfied with my family and my partner so but i realized how important it is to always work on your circle especially the close one so yeah i think that uh taking time off with people who grow you is important and um also seeing that people even though they have thousands of employees in their companies or they are millionaires or billionaires they kind of ask the same questions we do so it you never get it get it right or you never have you know the the magic tree that will resolve all your problems so it's that that was beautiful to see and really you know cool. what made me feel what's like he it. like branson yeah well richard branson is he as eccentric as 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 the media makes him out to be is his mind yes. is calculated or because because it, it, it comes across like for me the Obviously, he's kind of built this incredible, these incredible businesses, right? And he is a marketing genius in his own right. But there's obviously a mind behind him that is quite astute to figuring out a problem and providing a solution. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, he is as eccentric and bold and crazy. I don't know exactly how old is he. He is indeed like he looks like grandpa, right? He is a bit slower than I expected, right? And so on. Really? Uh, Yes, yes, but his like his vision, and we didn't talk much, right? Like we didn't spend the whole day together. Right? We were together at lunch or uh, dinner. At some point, we were in the same boat together, and so it was a bit more intimate. We could talk, but his very his ideas in general are very like, yeah, that doesn't work. Let's like I don't like how these airline companies do this because I can't bring my kid. Whatever, I'm just gonna build it myself mm. I build like company myself right or all these kind of things and if you interact with his companies you can see the level of details they they go into and that's well of course he works with incredible people but he brings the vision right he sells mm -hmm. the dream and it's like we want these people like to feel extraordinary and we add, we want to add all the things the other companies don't have and even the employees on his island they are so happy to be there like most people, I, I asked them, so they were not paid to tell me this, right? But I, I had really honest conversations with some of them and I said, I really love the vision. I love what, what's happening on the island. I love how we are instructed to take care of the people. Everything is so beautiful and chill. And like, we just love the environment. We work here because we love Virgin. Not because they don't have other opportunities, right? Because they live on the island. So they always live on the island, right? So the opportunities are more limited, but they love the vision and they love what they're working on and they know how important their role is there, right? So they feel like they do something meaningful in do the you world. Feel like, do you feel like your time spent there was worth it? Yes, yes. Especially as a first time experience. Yes. And especially for someone who's some sort of at the beginning of the career. And getting to meet those incredible people, yeah, they, they, it sticks with you. Your first time of, of meeting someone like that really does kind of, it sticks with you for yeah. a while. And it doesn't rub off. But the Richard from... was only one 
part of the puzzle. Yeah. The other 14 entrepreneurs who went there were really incredible. I learned so much from them. I had so many meaningful conversations with them. We did so many funny things together. We danced together. It was it was beautiful. We had many bonding activities and so on. It was it was like those three days and a half, four days were like outside time and space. They were beautiful. Bucket list experience. That's a, that yes. is amazing. Look, I I want to touch on something you said. Uh, everyone, no matter where they are, whether you running a billion dollar company, a million dollar company, you know, you're one stage in front, one step in front of where you and Anna is today. We're all human in its own respects, in their own respects. What did you, why do you build what you're currently building? Like what makes it beautiful? Mm -hmm. I feel that sometimes we get caught up in the, I want to build a billion dollar company. I'm, I'm trying to make the world impactful, but like internally, what makes the pain of building out it beautiful? Like what makes it incredible for you? Uh, there are many responses to this question. So let me let me pick. So the vision behind Outed is that we want to make the online world a safer place for everyone. As right now, it's not. And we are used to it. And that's a problem. Amount, like the number of bots online, we're talking about 30, 40% of total user, of the total user um, number are bots, which is, not okay on almost more on on the most uh known social medias which is not okay we're talking about a lot many trolls a lot of hate everywhere everyone is throwing tomatoes at everyone everyone can say everything about the other person without having any consequences because they can create 10 more accounts they were talking also about scammers right people selling things you don't care about all the time or sending you links about different things that you should really not click on and so on it's like the wild it's like a wild jungle this is what the online world is right now so what the vision behind all that is to make it safer and more civilized i want my younger sister to be safe online i want my grandma to be safe online because right now they're not they are two very vulnerable groups of people right who can be fooled very easily and they're not safe and we need to do that someone needs to do that and we think that with what we do at audit right now and the the other products we eventually want to build at audit will help achieve at least part of that vision for sure so that's one thing that makes me want to wake up in the morning and put the effort to make this happen and also for me companies are just tools and that's very important i'm not married to this idea right i think this is the company I think is the best for me to build right now with the skills I have, with the people I know and so on, with the co-founder I have and so on. If in a few years from now, there is another opportunity, I see another problem in the world I really feel like I want to resolve or I want to add value to people's life in a way, I'm just going to do it. That's it. It's just a tool. It's not, it's not about the company itself. It's about where you want to get. What are your goals? What is your what vision? Is what is the best piece of startup advice that you've received in your time building? Well, many. I read so many entrepreneur, entrepreneurial and manage, managerial books. So many. And I talked with so many people. But I'd say if you have nothing but one thing um, that you can do is who is more important than how. Always find the right people to connect with. Always ask for introductions. Always bring the right people in your team who are smarter than you at what you need them to do who are as aligned as you who have very similar values like um, like you and so on so people like who is more important than how you do the things a good team can get through 10 pivots and then you eventually can be all the unicorn a bad team you can have a great idea but the team will never make it so and not only with talking about the team but also about your stakeholders the investors you bring in right the ecosystem around your startup because you can say yeah we're b2b we work with companies we help them verify the identities of their users but wait a second if you zoom out we're talking about regulators we're talking about policymakers we are talking about the consumers right we are talking about governments we are talking about businesses indeed politicians startup founders we're talking about so many people who are involved in this ecosystem you need to be immersed into the ecosystem so who always look for who 
people can save you time and money all the time by sharing some some piece of knowledge with you or by opening a door else you can do for them Anna, that is absolutely incredible i'm definitely going to take some of that on board but i'd love to jump into like kind of our last session our quick fire round where i say a short statement um, and you respond with like a short answer how does that sound perfect let's go for it i'm ready where do you want to be in 10 years and is out did it for you i don't see myself being out it in 10 years from now because there are many other problems I want to resolve. Uh, having a few kids, probably, in 10 years from now, retiring my family, and, yeah, having a very lovely and sweet husband. Of that. How do you balance creativity and intuition with rational rigor and strategic thinking? I don't have the perfect answer for that. Still struggle with that. I, th I think it's a lot about boundaries uh, and being confident in yourself and being very kind with yourself. I'm a creative person, not the most logical one in the team for sure, um, but I'm fine with that. And I work towards improving that. And I'm aware of it. That's important. Do you believe in work-life balance? No, <laughs> not at all. I think if you try to balance both, you suck at both. I, right now, Mm, career is my focus my work is my focus my impact is my focus of course I spend time with my family and I go home every few months and I, I'm there for important dates and all these things but one focus at a time yeah are you happy in what you're doing yes I learned to be happy because only since the beginning of this year I started to actually be happy and fulfilled and joyful and grateful it really, it really does feel good when you kind of when you kind of accept it doesn't it it feels okay it, you feel so light and that's beautiful yeah and this has been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for your time and i look forward to doing this again in the future maybe i'm gonna be the one interviewing you in the future <laughs> oh, let's hope so oh, i'm not too sure about that <laughs> but this has been awesome i'll speak to you soon thank you thank you so much viraj you're such a wonderful person and great questions i love them all